Hello and welcome to I Know Dino. I'm Garrett. And I'm Sabrina. And today in our 461st episode, we have four new theropods. Yes. That's a lot of new dinosaurs. More than we've had maybe all year. There's a little bit of a slow start to the year, I remember, with new dinosaurs. Yeah, and then it quickly caught up. When it rains, it pours. Theropods. <laughs> <laughs> we also have dinosaur of the day, Alitopelta. I like the sound of that one. I know it's an ankylosaur. One of my favorite ankylosaurs, in fact. And, of course, we have a fun fact, which is about one of our new dinosaurs. And a really cool bird behavior, which is insanely aggressive. Oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but before we get into all of that, we want to thank some of our patrons for helping to keep the podcast running. And this week we have a new patron to thank, and that's Ellie Raptor. Thank you very much for joining. And then rounding out our shout outs, we've got Reed, Elijah, Ermel, Xenorama, Gabrielle, Bruce, Timo from Pro Art Cut, Wouter, and Remy Rodriguez. Awesome. Thank you so much for being a Die Know It All. We're happy to have you here. The more Die Know It Alls, the merrier. <laughs> <laughs> so, jumping into the news, we've got our first new theropod. This paper just has one. Unlike one of Sabrina's, it has two new theropods. Spoiler. <laughs> This one was published in Scientific Reports by Soki Hattori and others. In it, they describe what they call the earliest quote-unquote definitive dinochirid. I always like it when it's definitive, like mm -hmm. others may think they have the earliest, but ours is the earliest definitive in whatever group. <laughs> so, for now. Yeah. Actually, they sort of set themselves up for maybe not being the first they like propose it later. But mm. anyway, this one was described from Japan. It's named Tyrannomimus fuquiensis. Fuquiensis is after Fukui, Japan, where it was found. And the genus name Tyrannomimus means tyrant mimic. Watch out for this one. Yeah. So I thought there were two likely explanations for the name. Most likely, I thought, is that the dinosaur would be closely related to Tyrannosaurus because almost every dinosaur that has Tyranno or Tyran in it, is related to Tyrannosaurus. I get more into that in the fun fact, because mm -hmm. I needed to confirm that idea I had in my head. But then the Mimus part is very different, because that's usually how you end the big ostrich-like Ornithomimosaurs, like Gallimimus, Ornithomimus, and Struthiomimus. Mm -hmm. So it's sort of exact opposite ends of the spectrum. You've got the ostrich likely herbivorous toothless fast running <laughs> things with the mimus part and then you've got like the biggest not slowest but not particularly fast compared to an ornithomimosaur tyranno part hmm was it really big so yeah that's what it seems like maybe it was a huge and ferocious ornithomimosaur which is a little bit closer of a guess than it being a, a tyrannosaur but it's really a fairly typical ornithomimosaur but it has an ilium, the top part of the hips, which has a vertical ridge on it that was previously only found on tyrannosauroids. Oh, that's the link. Yes. And that sounds like a really specific and weird way to identify something as a tyrannosaur mimic. But that little vertical crest on the ilium is actually pretty important in identifying tyrannosaurs. Hmm. It's not just like, oh, it's got this one thing that's a little bit tyrannosaur-like and some obscure part of a bone. It's actually kind of... a a big deal. So it is an ornithomimosaur. So the mimus part is the more important part of the name when it comes to figuring out what kind of dinosaur it is. Makes sense. It would be kind of weird if they named a like big tyrannosaur that looked like Tyrannosaurus, Tyrannomimus. <laughs> I mean, you could, but it'd be kind of funny. Being a ornithomimosaur, it looks a lot like what you think of when you think of something like a gallimimus, meaning it may have been an herbivore, it wasn't particularly tyrant-like. Hmm. It was probably about three meters or maybe less, making it under 10 feet long. Oh, yeah, that's not very big. Not a very tyrant of a <laughs> ornithomimosaur. But one really cool thing about it is that sometime in the early Cretaceous, ornithomimosaurs split into ornithomimidae and dinochiridae. 
The main difference being that dinochirids lacked some adaptations for running fast, so they were probably slower than the ornithomimids. This might help explain why dinochirids had such impressive claws later on. That's just mm. a random aside, I'm saying, not the researchers. So maybe the dinochirids were sort of choosing the fight side and the ornithomimids were choosing the flight side of the fight or flight equation. Maybe, but I thought the large claws of dinochirus was for digging and getting plants. It could be. Defense. Hey, we'd never know for sure, but yeah, that is possible too. But with dinochirus, it's about 50 million years more recent than tyrannomimus, so they're not really that close hmm. in time or space or body type <laughs> <laughs> that's all the things yeah but tyrannomimus comes from the kitadani formation which is probably about 120 million years ago plus or minus about five million years and because of that before it was named tyrannomimus was informally called the kitadani ornithomimosaur for years before this paper was published and gave it an official name the Kitadani quarry includes the Megaraptorin Fuquiraptor and the Therizinosaurian Fuquivenator. So now there's a relative of Megaraptor, a relative of Therizinosaurus, and a relative of Dinochirus, all from the same spot, which is pretty cool. Those are some of the weirdest and most interesting dinosaurs. Yeah. The Kitadani formation is also known for having a high concentration of theropods, including multiple specimens of Tyrannomimus. Yes, because ornithomimosaurs are theropods. Yes. Yeah. Weird, probably herbivorous theropods, but just like <laughs> the Therizinosaur that's also there could be. Since there are multiple Tyrannomimus, they combine multiple individuals into this paper. They obviously picked bones that they think are from one individual as a holotype, but then they have a bunch of paratypes and like preferred bones that they think are also from Tyrannomimus. That's nice. It gives you a fuller picture of this dinosaur. Yeah, but it's still, they basically have this scattered set of bones from like throughout the body of several individuals. Even when you piece it together, you're still missing huge pieces of the skeleton. Mm. So they ended up with parts of both legs and feet They've got arm and hand bones. They have several hand and foot claws, two really tiny skull fragments, some vertebrae and hips, but none of the limbs are close to complete and there aren't more than about five consecutive vertebrae. Oh. So it's still a pretty loosey-goosey <laughs> skeleton, although the hips are in pretty good shape and some of the other bones that you use for identifying an ornithomimosaur, they have some pretty good bones to work with. Mm -hmm. Being from Fuqui, it's from the early Cretaceous, which doesn't sound that old, but you may remember that earlier I said we think that ornithomimids and dinochirids split sometime in the early Cretaceous, and about it being the oldest quote-unquote definitive dinochirid, the other big contenders are Beishanlong and Avia Tyrannus. Beishan Long could be older or younger. There's a lot of overlap in the formation age estimates. But according to the phylogenetic analysis in this paper, it's not a dinochirid, but a more basal ornithomimosaur from before the split into the dinochirids and the ornithomimids. So that takes it out of the running. Yes. So it's earlier, but it's not in dinochiridae according to their analysis, or it could be earlier. Avia tyrannus which is spelled with an I-S at the end for some reason. I found that really weird <laughs> because almost every dinosaur that ends in us is U-S, but this mm. one's I-S. But Avia tyrannus was presumed to be a basal tyrannosauroid and a really tiny one like Compsognathus size. Oh, cool. I haven't heard of that one before. Yeah. The only two known specimens could be from juveniles, so that could be why they're so small. Mm. But the name is really fun. It's Avia Tyrannus Jurassica, meaning Tyrant's Grandmother from the Jurassic. <laughs> At least that's what they're going from. I really like that. You do. Because Avia is Latin for grandmother, which mm. is just, it's so cool. Actually, I wonder if maybe the IS is because it's feminine. Yeah, could be. But Avia Tyrannus has a quote unquote strikingly similar ilium to Tyrannomimus. And in this latest phylogenetic family tree, Avia tyrannus is listed with the other dinochirids, which, of course, this needs more analysis because they were mostly looking at dinochirids and not theropods in general. 
But if that stands, since Avia tyrannis is from the Jurassic, with the Jurassica species name, obviously, it would be much earlier, about 20 to 30 million years older than Tyrannomimus. Oh, that's why you said the authors kind of left this opening for why their dinosaur is yeah. not necessarily the oldest definitive dinochirid. Exactly. It's like the title of the paper could have been like oldest dinochirid, but then they were thorough in their analysis and they were like, as they were doing more research, it's like, oh, there's this other one that really looks a lot like a dinochirid. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Which is actually really cool that this thing that was considered a really early tyrannosauroid might actually end up being a really early dinochirid. The only bones known from the two Avia tyrannus individuals are hips. They have that same ridge that up until this point was considered a slam dunk (laughs) analysis as a tyrannosauroid, but now obviously it's not that clear. They also, I should note, referred some isolated teeth to Avia tyrannus in the past. Other researchers have. So if it turns out that there were these sharp, D-shaped, small, tyrannosauroid-looking teeth Mm -hmm. that are from Avia tyrannus, that makes it a lot less likely that it's a dinochirid, but still not impossible because tyrannosauroids and ornithomimosaurs are both salurosaurs, so they're not that distant of relatives. So it could be that they had a common ancestor that had some of these traits and that it, the really early ones, the really early dinochirids may have something in common with tyrannosauroids. Hmm. Just goes to show that things are often in flux. Yeah. And I love dinochirus so much that I want to know all about its family tree. <laughs> Where did these things come from and why? <laughs> I don't know how often we know the whys of things. Yeah. Well, sometimes you can be like, oh, there was this kind of plant available or the environment was in this way mm. favoring one trait, but dinochirus is just so weird. We'll get into more new theropods in a moment, but first, a quick break for our sponsors. Well, as promised, I've got two new theropods to talk about. I've actually got three, but... Two of them were, were talked about in one paper, so we'll cover them first. There's specifically two new abelosaurids that were found in Morocco. This was published by Nicholas Longrich and others in Cretaceous Research. Now, neither of these two new abelosaurids have been named. They're based on one bone each. But the researchers are confident that they're new theropods? Yes, They're new, and it's cool because it helps show a diversity of dinosaurs in what is now Africa. Cool. They're just exhibiting a little bit of restraint in not naming dinosaurs really early when all they have is one bone. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) But just to to give you a refresher, abelosaurids were carnivorous. They walked on two legs. They had short snouts and short arms and stocky legs, and many of them had bony crests above the eyes. So you can have a generic picture here. Like Carnotaurus is a pretty typical example of an abelosaurid. Mm -hmm. So like I said, these two new dinosaurs were found in Morocco. They lived in the late Cretaceous and they were found in the Ouled Abdon Basin. And as the authors pointed out in the paper, quote, the latest Cretaceous of Africa remains largely unknown with only a handful of taxa reported so far, end quote. Those dinosaurs include a titanosaur, the hadrosaur Ajnabia, the large abelosaur Chinonosaurus, and now these two new abelosaurs. So there's going to be at least three abelosaurs in that area. Yeah. Although I guess that area is all of Africa, or is that from that one basin? I think it's from that one basin. Okay. (laughs) Yeah, so maybe three abelosaurs lived alongside each other at the end of the Cretaceous. These fossils are from the latest Maastrichtian, quote, in the final million years or so before the KPG boundary, end quote. So pretty close to the end there. And what's so cool about it is it shows a lot of diversity before the end Cretaceous mass extinction. So it kind of goes back to that debate, were they already in decline, the dinosaurs? No. (laughs) (laughs) Is the answer. (laughs) Yeah. And as the author said, until now, not many species are reported. And they said, quote, this is partly because Africa has historically been understudied and partly because of the rarity of uppermost Cretaceous terrestrial deposits in Africa, end quote. It's kind of a double whammy. There's not that much to find and not that many people looking for it. 
Yes. But maybe more people will be looking now. I hope so. It seems that way. These fossils were found in marine beds with a lot of marine reptiles, including mosasaurids, plesiosaurs, sea turtles, as well as ocean-going pterosaurs and bony fishes and sharks. And like I said, as for the other dinosaurs, specifically it was a partial hind limb of a titanosaur, the teeth and jaw of the abelosaur Chinonosaurus, and then the hadrosaur, which is a small lambiosaurine hadrosaur, Ajnabia. And apparently there's more fossils too, but they're still being studied, so we don't really know about them yet, or at least the public doesn't know yet. There's a lot of good fossils in Morocco, although most of the ones we talk about are from like if not the early Cretaceous, right around that early to late shift, like 100 million years ago with Spinosaurus and stuff. Yeah. Not this Maastrichtian. I didn't even know they had Maastrichtian. Yeah. I hadn't put that together. I mean, we've talked about Ajnabia before, but I guess I forgot that it was from Morocco. They said that, quote, fossils occur in laterally extensive bone beds, potentially extending tens of kilometers, end quote. That's a lot of fossils. Yeah. A lot of potential, that's for sure. It's mostly isolated fossils. There's some that are associated or articulated, so put together. But in the paper, they wrote, quote, they often show partial disarticulation or missing elements, suggesting decomposition and scavenging during or before emplacement on the seafloor, end quote. Yeah, there's a lot of things in the ocean that are happy to get an easy meal. Yes. <laughs> Take some chomps out of it before it makes it all the way down. And they said, quote, dinosaurs are uncommon, but after many years of extensive collecting, a picture of the dinosaur fauna is emerging. So that's exciting. Yeah. Yeah, you can see you mentioned sharks and it's I was wondering, like, if there are sharks, usually you don't get a lot of dinosaurs. Those tend to be different places. But it, I guess it's mostly these marine things with the occasional dinosaur that went out to sea and sunk. Yeah. But it's interesting thinking about three different abelosaurids all living together mm -hmm. or alongside each other. It's not like Golden Girls are not actually living together, splitting cheesecakes. <laughs> golden Girls is where you go. <laughs> I, I saw someone wearing a Golden Girls shirt recently, so it was on my mind. Okay. <laughs> anyway, back to the dinosaurs. One of the species, going back to the two new abelosaurs that, again, they're, they don't have names. One of the species was found close to City Shinan. They found a tibia, a shin bone, of a medium-sized abelosaurid, and they're estimating this abelosaur was about 16 feet or 5 meters long, and that's based on it having a hatchet-shaped or, quote, strongly hooked nemeal crest, end quote, as the ridge at the front of the head of the shin bone. Similar hooked nemeal crests have been seen in other abelosaurs, like Genusaurus from France, and a few others like Acosaurus and Scorpio Venador. The length estimate of this medium sized Abelosaurus, based on comparing it to Acosaurus, this bone has a rough texture, so it was probably mature. And it's not just a juvenile Chinonosaurus Abelosaur, which was large, and that one was estimated to be about 23 to 26 feet or 7 to 8 meters long. So this is a lot smaller than that? Yeah. And also, even though it has a rough texture, the bone, there was no signs of pathology. They said it doesn't resemble, quote, fracture callus or healing bone, end quote. So that's why they think it's a new species. The second new species was found near the town of Sidi Dawai. They found a small right second metatarsal. So that's in the foot. Yeah, sort of like in the middle of the foot. And it was 191 millimeters long. So about eight inches. Yeah. Yeah, not very big. And it was complete except for damage at the very end. I mean, eight inches isn't that small for just a middle of the foot bone, but I guess for dinosaurs that have pretty long feet. <laughs> they think this abelosaur was much smaller, about eight and a half feet, which is 2.6 meters long. That is pretty small. And that's based on comparing with Spectrovenator, which is, quote, the most complete small abelosaur known, end quote. So they're thinking they had the similar proportions. And that's because this new abelosaur had similarities to abelosaurs like Spectrovenador, but also similarities to noosaurines like Mexicosaurus and an unnamed abelosaur from the Candeleros formation in Argentina. But it's different enough because it's more robust and the shaft bows inward more so than seen in other dinosaurs. Assuming it didn't just get bent during fossilization. 
they didn't mention that in the paper. But this dinosaur is small and gracile, and that combined with the unusual shape shows it's probably not closely related to other latest Cretaceous abelosaurids. They did say it's possible it's from a juvenile. It's hard to compare. There's not much overlap in fossils. But they also said the, quote, dense, a vascular outer surface histology of the bone is typical of mature adults in extant birds and in abelosauroids, end quote. So the bone texture also shows that this probably came from a mature individual. And they wrote, quote, the animal therefore appears to be an adult. So yeah, uh, not too much, I guess, in terms of number of bones, but pretty cool that there are all these abelosaurs and that there might be some more discoveries coming out of this area soon. Yeah. And I do appreciate that they resisted the urge to name two new dinosaurs based on these individual bones. I knew you would say that. (laughs) As I was reading the paper, I thought you would appreciate this. (laughs) It makes it way less exciting in terms of like writing press releases or getting people pumped about the new dinosaur discovery that you have. But In the grand scheme of things, it's nice if later on somebody finds a much more complete version of one of these individuals, Mm -hmm. of one of these dinosaurs, and they can just name it as the holotype without having to worry about, oh, the holotype was named based on this one bone, right? and nobody's going to let us make this the neotype, (laughs) so we're all going to have to deal with this one bone being the official namesake of the dinosaur, which isn't all that good for all these years. Yeah. Considering, especially like you were saying, they're really just starting to get into this area and do a lot of digging. Mm -hmm. So there's a decent chance that that will happen. They will find uh, a more complete skeleton at some point. Maybe they already have. It's just not published about yet. Yeah, it could be. That'd be cool. Mm -hmm. And our last new theropod for this episode is about a new early bird-like dinosaur with long legs. This was published in Nature by Li Ming Shu and others. It has long legs, huh? Yeah. (laughs) That's its claim to fame. That is its claim to fame. There was a headline I saw, leggy bird hints at a swampy past. (laughs) What? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, so technically it's a bird. It's an Anchiornithid avialin, which is the most basal of birds. It lived in the late Jurassic in what is now Fujian province in China. It's estimated to be 148 million years old. The type species is Fujian venador prodigiosus. The genus name refers to Fujian province, where it was found, and hunter, so Fujian hunter. And the species name means bizarre, and that refers to its odd long legs. (laughs) Some of us just have odd long legs. We don't need people calling attention to them. (laughs) (laughs) I think your long legs are more proportional. Kind of, yeah. They're pretty skinny. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> anyway, these fossils were found between October and November of 2022, so they published that pretty quickly. Yeah, that is very fast. The holotype's articulated and partially complete. It's on a slab and a counter slab, and it's around the size of a coquelis pheasant. Hmm. I don't know what that is. Well, based on its femur, it's estimated to weigh about 641 grams. Okay, so that's like a, a pound and a quarter. Yeah, pretty light. A leggy light bird. (laughs) It's not a skeletally mature specimen, though. There's some unfused bones, so they think it's a subadult. Okay. That's why they didn't name it based on it being small, because who knows how big it would have gotten. Although if it's a bird, probably not super huge. Yeah, you never know. That's true. (laughs) So it had a long tail. It had those long legs, a bird-like body with wings. It was covered in feathers, and the paleo art shows a tuft of feathers on the top of its head. And it also had a long snout. And the tibia, the lower leg, is twice as long as the femur, the thigh. Wow. Yeah, and the femur is robust. See, now now are you getting why the... <laughs> why it has Why it legs. got its name, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the authors wrote that this is, quote, a previously unknown condition for non-avian dinosaurs. It's the really long legs. Really long tibia and short femur. Yes, suggesting it was either a high-speed runner or a long-legged waiter, end quote. They also wrote, quote, this finding contrasts with other early avialins, which are thought to have been more arboreal and aerial in nature, end quote. Yeah, you don't have hugely long legs for flying. That's kind of the opposite of what you want. Or living in trees. 
Yeah. <laughs> to get in the way a little bit. You don't need to stand really high off branches. But if you're in like a swamp, it could be really useful. Yeah. Waiting. Or what was the other one that you suggested? A high speed running, like a road runner situation. Yeah. Hmm. Now, there was some discussion on the dinosaur mailing list that pointed out that while this is an important find, Fuji and Venador being a ground dwelling Anchiornithid isn't really surprising, and mentioned the paper about the feed of early theropod flyers, which includes Anchiornis. That paper was published at the end of 2022 by Michael Pittman and others. It's open access if anyone wants to read it, but we did talk about that back in episode 432. That's where they looked at the toe pads, foot scales, and claws. I think we focused more on Microraptor at the time, having feet like a hawk, but they also found that Anchiornis and Archaeopteryx probably lived on the ground. They were ground dwellers, not aerial or arboreal tree dwellers. I think that may have been the paper. I need to go back and double check, but that may have been the one where they suggested Archaeopteryx may have been secondarily flightless, meaning that it evolved from something that used to be able to fly. Oh, I don't remember if that was the paper. Yeah, that's been an idea that's been tossed around one way or another. Yeah. Because its proportions, too, are kind of weird for something that flies. So the reason that the authors think Fuji and Venador lived in a swampy area was because it was found with aquatic and semi-aquatic animal fossils like turtles and ray finned fish. And they said that the swamp-like environment was, quote, a previously unknown ecological niche for early avialans, end quote. First swampy bird. Yeah. <laughs> now, more than 100 well-preserved fossils were found in this area, which they said constitutes a promising new late Jurassic terrestrial lagerstatte, end quote. So they're saying that this area is now known as the Zhenghe fauna. Cool. Mm -hmm. I'm sure there'll be a lot more papers then about the fossils from this area. Yeah. Now, birds descended from non-avian theropods in the late Jurassic, but it's unclear what the earliest phases of that looked like. And this finding is really cool because it helps us better understand the evolution and origin of birds. Although it's hard to say for sure that this one is the lineage that eventually led to what is today's birds. Could have been a dead end. It's very hard to know for sure. Oh, but it's in the group that's the most basal of birds. We think. Mm. Well, that's how it's been classified so far. By these researchers. Yes. <laughs> I'm saying there are other people that think other groups are the most likely earliest birds. Yeah. Fuji and Venator had features shared with other stem avialans and troodontids and dromaeosaurids, which shows, quote, the effects of evolutionary mosaicism in deep avialan phylogeny. I have no idea the correct way to say that mosaicism. <laughs> I think, wait, well, it's definitely mosaic and it ends in ism. I think we got it. Mosaicism? Yeah. Okay, because it really looks like mosaicism. I <laughs> mm. guess it depends where you put your emphasis. Yep. Emphasis. I ah, couldn't do it. <laughs> where you emphasize. Anyway, <laughs> it had similar hand bones to Archaeopteryx, similar pelvis to Anchiornis and Troodontids, and a hind limb kind of like Archaeopteryx and Anchiornis. And its foot bones had similar features to Dromaeosaurids and some Troodontids. So that's how you get that mosaic mosaicism ness <laughs> <laughs> just to add on the author said that there were quote few skeletal modifications that might have contributed to the refinement of aerial performance end quote in other words it doesn't really look like it was trying to fly yes body was all about other stuff <laughs> like running or waiting yes so as the authors summed it up Quote, Fuji and Venador is an example of an avian that diverged from this main trajectory and evolved bizarre hind limb architecture. However, that transformation has been overshadowed by changes in the forelimb, end quote. I just like that they call it bizarre. Mm -hmm. So it probably could run at high speeds or could wade, but the pedal digits are poorly preserved, so it's unclear what exactly it was doing with those long legs. But again... Based on other animals in the area, it may have been, quote, an agile predator or a wader living in a swamp-like environment. We just got to hope that they find the toes. Yes. <laughs> I guess it's very important. Which maybe they will because this is a good area to preserve bones. Mm-hmm. So we shall see. And that's four theropods as promised. That was a very theropod-tastic news segment. Yeah. Had to be done. 
we ranged from huge abelosaurs to little early birds and even got a dinochirid in there. That's what I like about theropods is there's so many variations. <laughs> there are. Well, we'll move on to an ankylosaur in a moment with our Yay. dinosaur of the day. <laughs> but first, here's a quick break for our sponsors. And now onto our dinosaur of the day, Alitopelta. This was a request from Victrix via our Patreon and Discord, so thanks. As we mentioned, it's an ankylosaurid. It lived in the late Cretaceous in what is now California in the U.S. It was found in the Point Loma Formation. Point Loma's a really cool spot. Mm-hmm. Good hiking to be done and some fun tide pools. And some dinosaur bones. <laughs> <laughs> Being an ankylosaurid, not too surprising. Probably if I say it walked on all fours, it had a bulky body, it was low to the ground, it was covered in armor, it had spikes, it had a long tail, and a relatively short neck. Sounds like an ankylosaur. Yes. And it had shoulder spikes that are like handles. If you were to ride it, that was <laughs> per Garrett's suggestion there. Well, because in the San Diego Natural History Museum, there's a big bronze Alito Pelta with the little spikes on it. And I can't remember if you're allowed to sit on it, and I did and held its little spikes, or if I just dreamed about it. But... I don't think you're allowed to sit on that one. Oh, that's too bad. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I thought about it so much that I can't even remember if it happened. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, yeah, we've seen it at the San Diego Natural History Museum, and they're the ones that have all the bones. Unfortunately, no skull was found, and also no club tail. Yeah, it's sort of like the... Almost like that Zool piece of the big middle piece that was on display where it's like all the armor sort of articulated mm. into like a splayed out, like a spatchcocked turkey mm -hmm. <laughs> middle part. <laughs> that's, Flattened. Yeah. That's like what they found of Alito Belta. It's not nearly as good of condition as Zool, but the same sort of general shape and orientation. Mm -hmm. And based on its unique armor, that's why they think it's an ankylosaurid, even though we don't have a club tail. Or a head. The two most important parts for identifying an ankylosaur. Yes. But it did have thick shoulder scutes and long spikes and polygonal scutes that covered the pelvis. But its shoulder scutes weren't like massive spines sticking out the sides like you see on a notosaur. No. They were like handles. <laughs> <laughs> now, ankylosaurids... They were covered in armor, and again, they had the club tails and the broader heads compared to notosaurids, so. Which had no tail clubs, which yeah. is why they're not quite as cool. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Alito Pelto is estimated to be about 16 feet or 5 meters long and weigh 2 tons. Originally, it was estimated to be almost 20 feet or 6 meters long, and actually, according to the San Diego Natural History Museum, also known as the NAT, this specimen was about 4 feet or 1.3 meters tall and about 13 feet or 4 meters long. So a bit of a range there. The type and only species is Alitopelta kumsi. The fossils were found during construction work in 1987. There was a skeleton found by a ditch that was being dug for a sewage pipe. They found a partial skeleton with osteoderms. Brad Riney, a paleontologist at the NAT, found the dinosaur and notice the dark brown fossils. There's a lot of marine invertebrates in the formation, as well as a femur, right lower jaw with teeth, and neck vertebra of a hadrosaur. Riney had also found those nearby hadrosaur fossils. As for Alita Pelta, it had a distinct leaf-shaped tooth, which is how they knew it was part of Ankylosauria. And the San Diego Natural History Museum got the specimen, and it was called the Carlsbad Ankylosaur for a long time. The holotype includes teeth, fragments of the shoulder, part of the arms, part of the pelvis, both legs, four to five partial vertebrae, fragmentary ribs, and osteoderms, including the pelvic shield and the cervical half ring on the neck. Yeah, I love cervical half rings. Those like armored necklaces is how I always think of them. Yeah. And they found eight teeth. They think it was probably an immature specimen based on its unfused astragalus that's in the around the ankle. The partly fused scutes and unfused neural spines. The fossils were described in 1996 by Walter Coombs Jr. and Thomas DeMare, but they weren't named at the time because they thought it was an indeterminate notosaurid with similarities to Edmontonia, Panoplosaurus, and Stegopelta. 
But then Alito Pelta was named in 2001 by Tracy Ford and James Kirkland. And when it was named, it was the only formally named dinosaur from California. Yeah, it should be our state dinosaur. Well, <laughs> that ship has sailed. I know. <laughs> You're just biased. <laughs> I am. The genus name Alito Pelta means wanderer shield. It's named for its armor and the fact that the skeleton had traveled a long way because where Alito Pelta was found way back when it died, what's now Carlsbad, California, was off the coast of what's now the middle of Mexico or just north of the middle of Mexico. Yeah, it was very much underwater. Yeah, but then tectonic plates shifted and it ended up in California. Lucky that there was really anything left after all this tectonic activity. The geology of California, especially the coast, is crazy. <laughs> A lot has happened in the last 66 million years. Yes. Well, you could say that about all of Earth. Well, but California is like this thing where it was like folding the side of the continent back on top of itself in crazy <laughs> ways and is nuts but we got a lot of this dinosaur that's good and then the species name is in honor of walter preston coombs jr coombs i and again it's based on its armor that they thought it was an ankylosaurid ford and kirkland did because originally it was thought to be a notosaurid but Ford and Kirkland further prepared the skeleton and they found these unique features. So they named it originally based on a number of features, including the teeth being wider than they were tall, having a long femur or thigh bone compared to the tibia and fibula, having a pelvic shield with polygonal osteoderms, a large short pointed spike in the shoulder, and then some other details in those osteoderms. And they said the pelvic armor had superficial similarities to Stegopelta. They wrote, quote, The pelvic scutes of Alitopelta are uniform in shape, although of different sizes. The scutes of Stegopelta are more irregularly shaped and are larger in relative size to the ilia than are those of Alitopelta. Later, I guess 14 years later, in 2015, Victoria Arbor and Phil Curry said that Alitopelta was unique in the osteoderms, including having hexagonal pelvic osteoderms, and the cervical half ring was made of osteoderms that refused to an underlying bony band. Some scientists had considered Alita Pelta to be a nomum dubium, but Arbor and Curry found it to be valid. And really, when it comes to ankylosaurs, if Victoria Arbor says it's valid, she's kind of the boss. <laughs> <laughs> she knows her ankylosaurs. <laughs> she does. <laughs> and she usually classifies them based on heads, too. So it's pretty good that this one didn't have a head and she still thinks it's valid. Yeah. It's nice. It is. What's really interesting about this specimen of Alito Pelta is that it formed a mini reef. Oh, weird. Yeah, because it probably died inland and then got swept away. So it bloated and floated out to the sea via stream and then sank to the bottom belly up. It was bloated with gas, swept away. Eventually, it decomposed or it got eaten by scavengers and then sank to the bottom of the water. Something popped it so that the gases escaped and it sank. Exactly. And once it sank, it became this miniature reef. <laughs> so weird. It was found with mollusks like oysters and spiny oysters attached to the bones and ammonites and gastropods near the skeleton. <laughs> and these made most of the limb bones hollow and there were a lot of shallow pits on the osteoderms and ribs. It's like making an artificial reef out of sinking a ship, except instead of sinking a ship, it's a sinking ankylosaur. Yeah, a little bit. A reef. <laughs> they also found fossilized oysters and a shark tooth with the bones. Interestingly, other notosaurids have been found in marine sediments, and some are known only from marine strata, including Notosaurus, Stegopelta, Papasaurus, and Neobrarosaurus. But Alitopelta is the first ankylosaurid to be recovered from marine strata. Yeah, that's true, because even Borealopelta, which was... Maybe not marine, but aquatic <laughs> was also a notosaurid, not an ankylosaurid. Yes. I'm trying to remember if Zool, I think Zool wasn't in a marine sediment though. Yeah, so pretty cool. And I'm glad that there are dinosaurs from California. It's a good one. You're just saying that because it's an ankylosaur. <laughs> it's a cool ankylosaur too, though. It is. I like the mini reef part. Yeah. And our fun fact of the day is that there are a dozen 
non-avian dinosaurs that include Tyran in their name. Oh. So Tyrannomimus is one of them. Tyrannomimus is only the second one that wasn't considered a tyrannosauroid when it was named. So in the back of my head when I was like, Tyran must be a tyrannosauroid. Mm. About 80 to 90% of the time, that is true. <laughs> then that makes sense. The other non-tyrannosauroid in the list of dinosaurs that have Tyran in them is Tyrannotitan, which is a close relative of Giganotosaurus. So it's not a tyrannosauroid. It's an abelosauroid. But it's also a huge predator. So really, they were all huge predators up to that point, or at least closely related to huge predators. The reason that Tyrannotitan has the name Tyranno is sort of similar to the reason that Tyrannomimus does. It's because there's a specific feature in Tyrannotitan, which was considered sort of a unique thing to Tyrannosaurids until it was found. But in this case, it's not in the hips, it's in the shoulder. There's a curve to the shoulder blade that's similar to Tyrannosaurids hmm. in Tyrannotitan. So I've got the full list of other Tyranno dinosaurs, but I'm not going to read them because I feel like that would be a little bit boring. But I will say, other than Tyrannosaurus, all of the names that are still considered valid were named after Jurassic Park. Interesting. <laughs> I mean, Tyrannosaurus was pretty popular before Jurassic Park too, so I'm not sure how much of a coincidence it is. But earlier we talked about how Jurassic Park spurred all of this digging activity looking for Tyrannosaurus and like a huge number of Tyrannosaurus started to be found after Jurassic Park. So it could be related. I think it might be. We, mostly you, Sabrina, have covered all but three of the valid genera. Oh. The only ones we're missing are Avia Tyrannus. Uh, I just was saying that was a new one to me. <laughs> yeah, and a pretty interesting one. Eo Tyrannus, which I thought we had covered. I searched for it a few times and I couldn't find it. We've covered other Eo dinosaurs. Yeah, I think that's what I'm getting confused with. And also Siamo Tyrannus, which mm. might not be a Tyrannosauroid, but it was thought to be a Tyrannosauroid when it was named. Are we going to get Dinosaur of the Day suggestions of these three, you think? Maybe. <laughs> Probably, I feel like Avia Tyrannus is definitely a contender. I mentioned Avia Tyrannus earlier, but again, it might actually be a Dinochirid like Tyrannomimus. So then there would be multiple, which are not Tyrannosauroids, but only two that were named knowing full well that they weren't Tyrannosauroids. I will say, though, there are also some modern dinosaurs or birds with the Tyran word part, most notably the family Tyrannidae not to be confused with Tyrannosauridae. Tyrannidae was named 80 years before Tyrannosaurus in 1825. Hmm. So you can't say like, oh, why were they naming the small bird after Tyrannosaurus? Really, Tyrannosaurus, if anything, was named after this ferocious small bird. <laughs> so the family Tyrannidae is also known as the tyrant flycatchers. We may have mentioned them before. They're pretty cute little passerines, aka perching birds. Of course, they're not very cute if you're a flying insect that they tend to hunt midair. Or if you're between it and the insect it was hunting, maybe? Yeah. <laughs> they swallow bugs whole, sometimes landing to bash them on something to incapacitate them first. And they have to regularly spit out pellets of insect exoskeletons, hmm. sort of like an owl pellet of mouse bones, but instead it's a tyrant flycatcher pellet of bug skeletons. <laughs> The smallest tyrant flycatcher is the short-tailed pygmy tyrant, averaging 4.2 grams or exactly 21 carats. No. Oh. I thought it'd be fun to use a weird metric for the English because like fractions of an ounce is strange. Mm -hmm. You go with carats like you could wear it on a ring. Oh, <laughs> that would be strange. Yeah. There are other contenders for smallest in case there are any birders out there, but they're all about four grams. The largest tyrant flycatcher is the Great Shrike Tyrant at about 100 grams, which is about 3.5 ounces or 500 carats <laughs> to keep the carats thing going. It's also about 29 centimeters or 11 inches long. And that's the biggest of these tyrants. Mm. So three and a half ounces, not particularly big. Well, depends on your perspective if you're an insect. It's true. And again, we have birds to thank for insects being small. So thank you, birds. <laughs> <laughs> a genus inside Tyrannidae is Tyrannus, a.k.a. the king birds. 
despite their small size, they really live up to their name. They're famous for fiercely defending their nesting grounds. I found two examples of kingbirds fighting off red-tailed hawks. Oh, that's what they're doing. You sent me pictures. <laughs> I thought they were like riding them. Kind of, yeah. So lots of birds like crows regularly dive bomb and otherwise harass hawks to get them to leave their areas. But kingbirds really take it up a notch and have a whole different strategy. So in both of the photos that I found, the kingbirds managed to dive onto the hawks, sink their talons into their backs, and then repeatedly peck the top of the head of the helpless hawks <laughs> until they fly away frantically trying to <laughs> escape. Wow. I found these two examples. One of them's from eastern Colorado. The other one's from Chicago, Illinois. And the kingbirds fought off the hawks despite the hawks outweighing them about 30 to 1. Good for the kingbirds. Yeah, so that would be like a human scaring off a rhino or a hippo, like climbing onto the back of a rhino and just like clubbing it on the head or something until it leaves you alone. Hmm. It would not work. No, that sounds too <laughs> scary and dangerous. Yeah, it used to be incredibly vicious to pull this move off, and I just love it. Apparently, they're not always as vicious. This is just during breeding season, hmm. and then they eat a lot of bugs in general, but part of the non-mating season... Some of them go down to like the Amazon and just eat a whole bunch of fruit in large groups, just hanging out. And then they get into mating season and they get really riled up. Jeez. I just couldn't believe that this tiny bird literally lands on the back of a hawk, digs in its claws and pecks it on the head. One of the accounts of this was like the hawk was already leaving. <laughs> <laughs> it just needed to make its point. Yeah, it was trying to get away. And then this thing lands on it and starts pecking it. And it just is trying to get away. It's not trying to fight or anything. It's just Never trying to come fly away. back. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Very ferocious. Mm -hmm. Aptly named Kingbirds, a.k.a. Tyrannus. Mm -hmm. And that wraps up this episode of I Know Dino. Thank you for listening. If you enjoy our show, please consider leaving a review. And stay tuned. Next week, we will be talking about yet another new dinosaur. Thanks again, and until next time. Good day.